Hello, this is Hushang Amir Ahmadi, a Distinguished Service Professor at Rutgers University. In the last few uh, YouTube videos that I have uh, presented in English, I have uh, tried to uh, see trends in the world capitalism, American capitalism, and the problems that uh, American capitalism faces for moving forward. And in the last video, I spoke about specific problems that America is facing as it is reflected in the uh, ongoing uh, protests in big American cities, which I think has used uh, the death of George Floyd as a pretext to express anger and fear that a good number of Americans these days face. <clears throat> I also, in a few videos, I spoke about U.S.-Iran relations and also I spoke about you know, the U.S. in the world economy, the global community, its competitors, rivals, enemies, and friends. <clears throat> I said that given what I said about America and its problems, that soon America might find that 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 enemies uh, may not be and should not be made a permanent enemy and friends may not be permanent friends or they should not be seen as such moving forward. That what de decides who is your friend or enemy is what your uh, national interest indicates or dictates. I said that American capitalism may fail to stay number one as China is a major competitor moving forward. I even said that a country like India in a few years may take over and make America number three even. I said that Europe is uh, deep in its own problems and may not be of help to America given its domestic uh, economic problems as well as international competition. I sort of, in one of the videos, I suggested that perhaps among the, all the nations in the world, Iran, which is an enemy now, may become a friend or should be made into a friend in the near future. America may need Iran and Iran may need America and in fact not may, I believe they will need each other. <clears throat> when I said these two countries, great nations, indeed do have common interests and they are compatible and more importantly, they are complementary when it comes to economic matters. America continues to be a nation of capital and technology and Iran is a country that offers the brightest manpower, skilled and very inexpensive indeed. Probably one of the most inexpensive labor force in the world now of course, relative to the skills and 
education that the American, that Iranians have. Combining Iranian resources, manpower or human power, of course, plus its natural resources, oil, gas, minerals, etc., and a great geography and a, uh, a domestic market of 80 some million, with American capital and technology, could indeed lead to a very serious economic advancement on both sides. But again, unfortunately, they are, as we speak, enemies. And I believe it's imperative that that changes to friendship, to partnership. It must, I believe. The future will tell us that I was right. Now, this is not going to be easy. The Islamic Republic is a theocracy, a government of God, which considers America the government of Satan. But then again, Iran is in such an economic despair and need that that particular ideological framework may not be sustainable and that could disappear soon. In this particular talk, I wanted to focus on that side, the side of Iran, and tell you what America could expect to happen in Iran. But before that, let me remind you all, as I said in my previous videos, that American foreign policy towards Iran has been one of pressure. Now they call it maximum pressure, meaning sanctions, economic sanctions, designed to bring Iran to its knees or at least force the country to come and negotiate American concerns with the behavior of the Islamic Republic. Behaviors in the nuclear side and missile sides and uh, you know the regional politics interventions and the rest of it. We also know, however, as we speak, the American administration, the Trump administration, doesn't have a regime change policy. They call it behavior change. Let's assume that they are honest and it's the behavior change. And they think <clears throat> that behavior can be changed through this maximum economic pressure and political isolation. Well, this is a 40-year story. For the last 40 years, this <laughs> saga has been played and overplayed and played over, <laughs> that is, many, many times. It hasn't gone anywhere. That, yes, at times, the regime has accepted to compromise, give concessions, but then only to a limited extent, just to make sure that the relation doesn't go toward war. And that any time that war pressure was lessened, mitigated, the Islamic Republic has gone back to the uh, to tension. If you remember, I said the policy of the Islamic Republic has been to maintain with America a relationship that I called no war, no peace. <clears throat> I said in the past videos that the only option 
for America moving forward with Iran is to remove this no war, no peace option from the table and leave on the table for Iran either war or peace, that is war and peace. Leave war and peace on the table and let the Islamic Republic decide, decides and choose one of the two. I have said and believe and my experience of 30 some years with US-Iran relations clearly indicates, to me at least, that when it comes to making that difficult choice, Iran has moved to the peace side because it knows it cannot fight America. But then American have been always handicapped in policy terms to immediately leave that table happy that they have got something in, from their pressure. Not staying the course and continuing with the peace or war options. And therefore, they have relieved the Islamic Republic of the war, but then because there is no pressure anymore, there they have not really responded to peace either. So the no war, no peace has to be moved from the, any table, negotiation table, I mean. Only war and peace. I know that Iran can't fight America. Everybody knows. Except perhaps the Americans themselves. I mean the administration, the White House. But I think they have to accept and understand and believe a person like Hussein Amir Ahmad that, that if they stay with the bar side and keep that either war up or peace on the table and press for it, I think the Islamic Republic will bend and will offer peace. However, there is a point where you can really force a country to knee, to come to your side. There comes a time when they will say, well, no. We have our own dignity, our pride, our nationalism, and the rest of it. And therefore, there is a point beyond which we will not go. Come and hit us. Come and destroy us. We will not just knee simply because you want us to do it. Iran has a very interesting history. This country of 3,000 years has had hundreds of wars with Romans, Romans with Greeks, with Arabs, the Mongols, the Turks, and, and you name it, British and so on. And except for a period in the beginning of their uh, empireship, they have been always a loser, except for a few cases. And yet, while Iran lost, Iran stayed, survived, and the winners disappeared. This is a great lesson to, to learn from about Iranians and Iran. So America must be very careful with its just pressure policy. It must find another way to also deal with Iran. And the way to deal with Iran, as I said, first is to remove this no war, no, no peace option off the table. And then, this, and the second part, I think the U.S. must Iran, offer Iran a peace plan, 
a serious peace plan that the Islamic Republic will not dare not to take. Because if they don't, if they were to refuse, then the Iranians would come to their streets and give them a hard time. But that has to be a big plan, a huge carrot. America should not be just only, only thinking in terms of a stick. Carrot is also a means towards a better uh, foreign policy and national interest as well as security. Well, I understand that America is a national security state. Unfortunately, that particular dogma prevents America from becoming a little bit more flexible and open toward enemies, toward those who don't want to just simply budge or, or, uh, or, or, or compromise. I believe now, particularly at this time that we are talking and given all the problems that I enumerated about America in my previous video, it's time for American foreign policy move from a national security dogma to a security to a development peace dogma, a doctrine, as you may say. America must make peace and economic development the key doctrine of its foreign policy moving forward. That will help. As I said in a previous video, President Trump, for the first time in the last 40 years, in fact, it's the, he's the only president that have spoken about a comprehensive deal, a comprehensive negotiation toward normalization of relations with Iran and economic cooperation. That's a great start. That's where my big peace plan comes, and that is the big carrot. America must stay with it and tell Iranians and this regime that you can take war and we are serious about it, but if you take peace, that's what we're going to do. We're going to help you build it. But make it very clear so that Iranian people will know that. And remember, when we talk about Iranian people, I don't mean the, just the opposition to the Islamic Republic in Washington and I don't know London or LA, who often speak to the people in the White House or the State Department and miseducate them, unfortunately. 70% of Iranians are Iranians that are below 45 years of age. That's not the Iranians that, that speak to the American policymakers, unfortunately. This generation is a different generation, different generation of 80s, 90s in Iran. When America puts that peace plan, that comprehensive negotiation toward normalization and economic cooperation, it must speak to this group of people. It must speak to this people, this younger Amer Iranians, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to just. Iranians of the, uh, that are now over 70 years old uh, and they speak to the White House and the State Department all the time. Forget about them. They're the Iranians that will determine the future are the Iranians who are under 50 at most, up to 50. Take, take that very seriously. 
Now, however, let me also say a few things about Iran. For America to really be successful with a new policy toward Iran, it must understand this regime better. America has failed to understand the Islamic Republic, really. I mean, this, this regime, this theocracy. That's a very important first step that has to be taken. So, what that really means is to listen to what is coming from the other side more carefully. Let me just, as, a, as examples, tell you about two sort of a speech. Ayatollah Khamenei, the leader of the Islamic Republic, has presented to the Iranian people over the last uh, almost two and a half months, three months. One in March, I believe, 24th, and another one just yesterday, that is June 3rd, both 2020. In the first speech, Khamenei indicated very clearly that it is not happy with the republic form of its government, that he thought this government has to be an Islamic government, meaning a government that has one ruler fully in control with people who will just listen. This is no democracy. This is no uh, republicanism. This is not something that you or I have heard or has been seen in recent history of any country. Yeah, we have dictators, but even dictators leave a space for some kind of a, uh, you know, protest and dissension and so on. Disagreement. Well, Khamenei has a plan. I want the American to know that. Khamenei's plan is to move away from republicanism to a very different system. And he has already pulled together a parliament that is semi-military with radicals and uh, military people. And it will indeed be the parliament that most likely will deal with the U.S. at some point. But there will be a government very soon in place of the current government. The Iranian presidential election is within a year. I believe and predict, and I can assure Americans, that that government will also be a semi-military. Semi-military in the sense that the, a, a, a coalition of military people and radicals will take over, but of course technocrats and others. The next thing that I believe is happening is that, as I said, Khamenei is going to, have to get rid of this republicanism and move to a completely different system. This system could continue to remain religious, theocracy, but it is possible that Khamenei is thinking of forming a different form of government, regardless of what the content is, I'm talking about the form. Uh, that form, I believe, will neither be Republican 
nor kingdom which Iran had before the revolution in 1979. Khamenei's intention is to form an, an, an empire, an Islamic empire, Iranian Islamic empire, away from republicanism and of course the kingdom that is already gone very much what Napoleon did after the French Revolution around 1800 and he declared himself an empire, emperor defeating both the royalists and the republicans that could happen now the islamic republic has also already operated on that basis this old force and its intervention in the region are the external manifestation of that particular tendency in the sort of like thinking of Mr. Khamenei. <clears throat> the question for America is, what should it do with that if it happens? Well, I think America should be accommodative to that development. <clears throat> the biggest problem America has with Iran today is theocracy, religious government. Any, any form of government is an, is an improvement. Well, if it could be a Republican, so much the better. But I think Republicanism in Iran has a has had a terrible experience and I don't believe republicanism is fit for Iran. It just doesn't go with what the Amer Iranians are. They are just not prepared for republicanism. Iran also had an experience with kingdom which failed. And uh, as against many beliefs and misunderstanding, Iran's history isn't that of a history of kingdom. It's the history of em em empire. Until almost 1600, that is a seventh century. Until then, Iran was continuously an empire. The Medes, the Achaemenians, you know, the Sassanid, and I mean before that, and we have the Arabs who took over, uh, and many others. Only after Ottoman Empire appeared in the Middle East and that part of the world, Iran was forced into putting its house in forms in the form of a kingdom, which indeed didn't succeed. That kingdom created disaster throughout the 17th, 18th and 19th century until the early 20th century. The point I'm trying to make is that it is very much possible that given the situation and the fact that Republicans and uh, Royalists are fighting for 
the future of Iran. I believe, and that is the source of division, I believe the move, to move forward, the best form of moving forward as a, for a form of government would be a, an empire. But the empire is a name. Empire doesn't mean that necessarily Iran should take over uh, countries in the region and so on. You know, that it's, this is just a, what I call the modern form of empire ship. You know, Japan is an empire, as an emperor. Yeah, uh, Britain calls it itself a kingdom. But when you look at it, it's not a kingdom, it's an empire. It was an empire, supposedly it gave up, it gave up, but it hasn't. Look at uh, the way they control certain part of the territories that, that they claim to be theirs. And some other countries. I think America is also an empire of a different form. Yes, it's a Republican empire. Empire in the sense that that it controls territories that does not necessarily belong to it or operates beyond its borders. <clears throat> that is an empire <clears throat> in a different one. Some people call it globalism, internationalism, and so on. But back to Iran, the point I'm trying to make is that America must understand the pulse beating in Iran, what is happening in that country and what Mr. Khamenei, the leader, is thinking and most likely not just thinking but doing, and that is to form an empire an Islamic empire. He has almost said that in those two speeches that I referred to. He openly says that the Republican form isn't good for us. And of course he says the kingdom is gone. But then what? His Republicanism is not good. His kingdom isn't good. So what fits them? I believe he he hasn't said it, he hasn't really used the word empire, but that's what he thinks should be uh, formed in Iran. Again, the empire he's thinking about forming is not what usually is understood of empires, a power that pulls together many countries or regions by force and dominates them. This is a new form of empire, a modern form of empire, the Japanese form of empire, perhaps. As I said, this is an improvement because a person like me who has understood, who has studied Iran for over 40 years, have been in U.S.-Iran relations for over 30 years, 35 years, I believe and I can assure you that a move in that direction will be in the best interest of America and the countries in the region. In the few uh, videos that I will present in the future, I will explain this further. But let me repeat myself and sort of like synthesize what I was trying to say. First, America needs Iran in the post-corona period because of domestic problems and international competition. Iran is the only one of the many, of one of the a few, I'm sorry, one of the one of a few countries left out there that could be helpful to America to rebuild. It has a population of 85 million consumer. 
it has an investment opportunity of over five trillion dollars in just a few years in many fields tourism agriculture oil gas and you name it minerals construction And it has the brightest labor force skill and the cheapest. Why should America let that go? America must be opportunistic and try to mend relation with the Islamic Republic. But it's going to be tough. The way to go forward it's not just maximum pressure, sanction, sanction, and sanction. It's not going to work. And sanctions only harm people. Governments easily are not toppled by sanctions. They always learn a way to transfer the impact of sanctions on people. And that's exactly what the Islamic Republic has done and is doing. America's way forward is to remove that no war, no peace off the table, give Iran a peace or war option, and be serious about it. But to start with, give Iran a peace plan. And if Iran didn't take the peace plan, then go for the war. But in both sides, you have to be serious. Either peace or war, it has to be really big, big stick, big carrot. In the carrot side, the biggest thing America can give Iran is an opening. Not only an opening that will be just directed toward gaining concessions for America, but also make Iran feel also a winner. The biggest person in Iran today, at least for the next few years, is Ayatollah Khamenei. That's a fact. If, if America doesn't understand that, that it doesn't understand anything about Iran. And don't listen to this bankrupt oppositions, including Hussein Amir Ahmadi. For that part, listen to me what I am telling you now. That guy, that Mr. Khamenei, is probably one of the most powerful leaders of the today's world. Why is powerful? First, he, had, he can really... <laughs> pulled together over $2 billion in assets that he controls. He has tremendous military power. The traditional army, revolutionary guard, Hezbollah, he's, and you name it, as well as security force. It has a lot of followers, and it has an ideological hold on many people in Iran. Remember, Iran has 85 million people. Don't just listen to 500,000 or a million or 2 million or 5 million or 10 million. Of 85 million Iranians, almost 60 million are in voting age. Listen to them. 60 million at least listen to 30 of them, the 30 million of them. Don't get confused with all this propaganda. That has been going, going on for 40 years without result. Only miseducating America and misdirecting its policy toward that country. So U.S. needs to understand that, to understand that this man is a big leader. I mean big, I mean powerful, whether we like it or not. And that 
when you talk to power, you must understand not just the concerns and ambitions, but also you have to understand the realities that he faces and the Iranian people and, of course, America. I think the most important thing to understand about this leader is to know that he has an ambition to build an empire. That's what it is. Believe me or not, that's what it is. You just have to understand and believe me on that. And you must accommodate that interest in a way that it will serve the best of American interests. And that's the key. Remember, 40 years ago, that is before the revolution, 40 some years ago, Iran was the best partner and friend of America in the region. And America gave Iran all kinds of military tools, making it a superpower in the region. And a gendarme of the region for us. The fact that Iran is being taken over by military and the radicals, and that Khamenei has that tendency toward building an empire should not concern America. Remember, at the end of the day, Iran will always remain a regional power, and America is a global power, and must act as a global power. I'm talking about America. So I believe there can be an accommodation here between the United States and Iran, and in this case particularly, I mean Mr. Khamenei. When the Khamenei is gone, you're talking about different things. I'm talking about the reality, what it is. I believe it is imperative that America really take account of what Khamenei is after and what this man is about, who he is, his power, his ambitions. His drives, desires, whatever. I think for America to accommodate his ambition will not be a pricey one. In fact, exact the opposite. It will pay off. At the end of the day, regardless of how emphatic he is, that is Mr. Khamenei, to build an empire, he will not be able to. He may, in fact, just be given a framework, a name, making him an emperor, and instead of Bali Fari, that is the, uh, the guy, the religious guy in power, and make him happy with it. You know, am I an, an idealist? Am I misunderstanding anything here? Believe me. Not. For the last 40 years, I have predicted Iran many, many, many times. And every time almost, I have been, I have been correct. I make that claim, you can ask anybody, Iranian community elsewhere. I know Iran inside out. I know Mr. Khamenei inside out. I know the Islamic Republic inside out. I know Iranian military force and others inside out. I know them. I have been, an, I was an insider until even today. I always have understood them better than anybody. So I am giving you my two cents to you, American leaders, political leaders. Don't listen to whoever that comes across you and tells you that the, the regime is in its way out. They have been saying it to you for 40 years. Don't listen. Don't believe. Calculate your interest 
and calculate your policy in the right way. Put that in the right direction. Stay powerful. Speak with power. As I said, no war, no peace. Either peace or war. Mr. Khamenei, and here is my peace plan. And in that peace plan, I have taken into account not just my interest as American, but your concerns and ambitions as well. Now, this is the time to make the deal or else the war will come. And the war will come. That's the issue. You must be very clear, emphatic and resolute with that. Otherwise, you fail. You will fail. You have failed, America. You will fail with the Islamic Republic if you don't listen what I say the way I say it. You have to do it that way. I believe, I believe it will pay off. Remember, at a stake is trillions of dollars in business, trade, and investment in particular. America needs Iran, and Iran needs America. But let me tell you, believe me, America needs Iran perhaps more than Iran needs America these days. You will see that soon, we Americans in this country have become very lonely. We don't have friends that much. You saw our friends in democracies across the world protested in the streets against us using George Floyd's death as a pretext. They don't want a nationalist America. They just want a globalist America that they can milk. But America needs to become nationalistic and it needs to be selfish. We haven't been. And to be selfish is to calculate with good criteria, the right criteria, who are or are not our friends. And we just have to be open-minded about that. We should not have permanent enemies or permanent friends, only permanent interests. That's the only way to go forward. I believe if you go in that direction, and that will of course require a, a serious paradigm shift in American foreign policy, particularly towards Iran. <clears throat> Moving in that direction will pay off. I can almost certainly assure you. I look forward to a day that that 